please welcome the Chief of the Division of Global Health Innovation at Massachusetts, Massachusetts General Hospital, Dr. Thomas Burke. Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, I'd like to start by saying thank you to the amazing leaders of the Minova Partners. This is really an extraordinary conference, in fact, rather unique and inspiring. And I also want to congratulate all of you for, after sitting and listening to HIV solutions, uh, drones, phage therapy that's curing people, this is really rather a shock and awe type of experience. And, uh, and uh, it's really exciting. So in the wellness department, be sure and take care of yourselves because uh, there's so much shock and awe that uh, Perhaps PTSD just from this conference could strike us. Anyhow, what I'd like to talk about is a small topic, innovating for a healthy planet. I'm actually going to bound that a little bit. What I'd really like to share, though, is a different way of thinking or opening our minds to a creative way of thinking that in making our world a more healthy place, there are opportunities within reach that are right in front of us and around us if we look and think in a different way. Now, I am going to bound this a little bit, even though, of course, we live on Mother Earth as humans. But think of this a bit in terms of our own species. And what do we know as a basic foundation that all of our countries on Earth have signed off on in the Declaration of Human Rights? All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. The enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being that sits in our WHO constitution. How are we doing with those? Not so great, especially we just heard from our last two wonderful speakers some of the challenges in our world around us, in the underserved communities, and those that are vulnerable and poor. Those are the regions that I'm going to specifically focus on. So I think it's really important that we think for a moment, what are the basic necessities that all of us on Earth share in order to have access to a healthy life? And that is critical because while we can think and dream of new and exciting innovations, MRI machines and other technologies, the truth is, unless we tend to the basic nails on the floorboard so that we can have access to a healthy life, that which we all share, our innovations what we think will be solutions will fail. So let's look at a couple of these. If you want to make a difference in the world, if you want to innovate and create solutions for the poor, the vulnerable, our brothers and sisters that live elsewhere in the world, we need to start here. If these aren't in place, we will fail. Well, let's look first. I'm going to describe eight, I call them freedoms. Freedom from unsafe water. Turns out that about a billion people on our planet don't have access to safe water. If we don't have access to safe water, it's very difficult to have a healthy life. Freedom from hunger. Hunger. Two billion of our 7.5 billion people on Earth don't have access to the food they need to lead a healthy life. Lack of sanitation. Do you know that more than half of our world's population doesn't have access to sanitation? And that is absolutely critical. Some of our greatest diseases arise from lack of sanitation. About 64% of our planet doesn't have access to sanitation. Freedom from violence, I think that doesn't require much more explanation. If we're in a violent circumstance in our ecosystem, it's very difficult to have a healthy life. Freedom from unsafe birth. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Freedom from infections, it turns out that if you really want to answer the question, what has been the most remarkable innovation that has transformed human health in the last 100 years, it's immunizations. It's our freedom from infections. Freedom from illiteracy, very interesting to see that literacy and education trends in a really direct relationship with our health. And then freedom from lack of employment. What does all this mean if you put it together? If you're a baby girl and you're born into this world, and you're born with HIV or some other infection, it's very difficult for you to have a healthy life. If you're born free of HIV, but yet you have now four pregnancies by the time you're 20, 
Very difficult to have a healthy life. If you are lucky enough to be able to control your fertility and you don't have four pregnancies by 20, but you're illiterate, you're still going to be stuck in your impoverished state and not be able to rise out of the poverty of your community. How about if you then are free of, free of infection, you are literate, and you don't get pregnant, but then there are no jobs for you. You'll leave, and the community remains impoverished. So our responsibility is to make sure that every human on this earth has access to these eight freedoms before we start adding complexities on top of them. Otherwise, they will fail. Let's think of a few examples that are right in front of us that might surprise you, but I hope will help trigger you to think in a different way. I am not promoting any particular brand or any particular company, but I put this up as an example. What is this? This is a transcutaneous hemoglobin monitor. It tells us, if we put your finger in it, it tells us what our hemoglobin level is, our blood count, our red blood cell count. This is pretty interesting. We have this now around the United States and another in our developed nations. I find this, from a global health perspective, from poor people in the world perspective, incredibly exciting. Why? So the number one killer, as we already just heard from, from Professor Agnes, we heard the number one killer of pregnant women on Earth is postpartum hemorrhage. So if we look, for instance, in East Africa, we recognize that hemoglobin level of nine is the mean hemoglobin level for women that are pregnant. Wouldn't it be great if we could just plug every woman's finger into the little light socket? Because if that's the mean, we know that there are going to be women that are low on the scale. And if they're low on the scale, we can do something. So wouldn't it also be great what kills children with malaria? Anemia. They die because they don't have enough red cells. Wouldn't it be great if we could just plug their little finger into this little socket? Or how about malnutrition? One of the great global scourges we still have, anemia. Well, so this device, what prohibits that? Well, it costs thousands of dollars. It's not scalable. But let's pause for a minute and ask ourselves, is there something we can do to make this go to scale? So the research and development was certainly amortized over the, when we think of the 12, 24 developed nations as being the market. And lo and behold, this has a nice foothold on the market and, uh, and uh, is, is, is making its way forward. Is there something we can do? So we doctors in the United States, Europe, Canada, Australia, we like to see that it's 12.4, the hemoglobin. We care. that We think 11.8 versus 12.4 makes a difference. Maybe we can think of some different ways that we can use this technology without what's the company worried about? That you do something and sell this now instead of thousands of dollars, you sell this for a couple hundred dollars, you're going to, just, you're going to make the com company go bankrupt. It'll cannibalize its own market. Well, how about if we change this to a clinical decision instrument using the same using the same technology, but green, you're fine. Yellow, warning, let's check it again. Red, you need to do something. Would that help clinicians in poor sectors around the world? Absolutely. Would US doctors and nurses and other healthcare providers want to use that device? No, that's not interesting. We want an exact number. So we can think in new and different ways. Here's another example. I'm old enough that I went to medical school in the, in the 1980s. And when I was going to medical school, if you had a heart attack, you would get a drug called streptokinase, a clot buster. And the drug cost about $150. You went to the hospital. And oftentimes, or usually, it would abort your heart attack. Well, what happens today? So if I suddenly had chest pain, I hope someone here would call 911 and I would get taken to the local university hospital or the local cardiology um, intervention center, and someone would put a catheter up into my heart and blow it up and put it in a stent, and it would probably cost $22,000. And if we pause for a minute, that's where we are today. And back in the 1980s, we had streptokinase. What has happened in between, and have we changed outcomes? Well, there are drugs that have come in between, there's all kinds, if one wants to look in the literature, there's some confusing elements where drug companies gave millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to the American Heart Association, recommendations changed. If you want to just look at the data, 
if you're not in the cardiac cath lab with a balloon open within 30 to 45 minutes, the outcomes are no different between streptokinase and the next set of drugs, and then ultimately getting an acute angioplasty. So what have we done, though? We've left poor people behind worldwide because we've established, we've established that if you are having a heart attack, you need to have a catheter put in, which most of the world cannot afford. And we've forgotten that we already had a solution that provided quality outcomes. Well, the same outcomes. In fact, for me to be in the cardiac cath lab, if I'm in a rural setting here in Minnesota and have my vessel opened, it's probably close to impossible. And that's true for most of the world. Not only can they not afford it, it's not geographically possible. So we've looked, and in India, you can actually find streptokinase, quality streptokinase in some few little places. It's about $25 a dose. So there's opportunity for us to create models where poor people on this earth also are allowed to have their heart attack aborted that are affordable. But we don't think of it, because that's not our mindset. So. This woman is representative of the greatest health disparity on Earth. And what is the greatest health disparity on Earth? It's that of pregnant women. There are places on Earth where one in six women will lose their lives from pregnancy-related causes. And then there are other places on Earth where one in 22,000 women will lose their lives from pregnancy-related causes. Really, this is inexcusable. We can and should do better. So, if we look at how do we, how do we address this? How do we innovate and say, how do we make a difference in the lives of women? Well, we really need to be accountable to impact. There are lots and lots of different pieces in making this change across a health system. I will tell you, coming from Harvard University, that so often we're incentivized to get stuck in the problem characterization bucket here. There are also other organizations that use a lot of processes. In fact, I remember um, there were a few UN agencies that reported their work for the year and their outputs for the year in terms of the number of meetings they had. This was about 11 years ago. And now all of us know, just because we go to more meetings don't, doesn't necessarily mean that more lives are saved. So we need to be accountable to impact. However, we do need to characterize and understand why women are dying. So if we look at this woman, we need to be able to ask the question, so why is she dying, or where are they dying? Who are the vulnerable women? Why are they vulnerable, and what are they dying from? And it turns out that postpartum hemorrhage, as was described earlier, is indeed the number one cause of pregnant women losing their lives on Earth today. So we were asked, we were asked about 11 years ago by the World Bank to create a package to address maternal and newborn emergencies in the country of South Sudan. And we ask ourselves authentically, how can we address maternal hemorrhage at the community level in a country like South Sudan? They don't have access to drugs. We came across, you know, uterine balloons work. We use them in the developed world. However, they cost $400. So that's an opportunity for innovation. As you'll see in front of you, there is a urinary catheter, a large one, a lure lock, these are little uh, one-way valves that are put in the end, and this is a condom, or just basically have relabeled the condoms with um, basically uterine balloon device. So here's a uterine balloon device that we began performing research on. We ended up having 23 publications, I think, now, now taken up in 28 countries, and uterine balloons that were in South Sudan that we originally tried, and they were $400 a piece, and I realized pretty soon I would go bankrupt and banging a tin cup in the corner, and then we had to devise this. This is now being sold in many countries for $3.50, and now performs the same. What's our challenge, though? Our challenge really is that there are stories, lots and lots of stories of lives being saved, but how do we go to scale? So this woman, you see the younger, this is a, a young woman who delivered twins. This is about three months ago. She delivered twins, and this is her mother next to her. She began hemorrhaging after she delivered her twins. 
couldn't stop the hemorrhage. This is in India. I happened to be at the hospital at the time. And she lost her pulse and her blood pressure, but still was gasping for air. They rushed her off to the operating room. The anesthesiologist said, we cannot put her to sleep because oh, that'll kill her. So then they placed the uterine balloon, this uterine balloon that I just showed you, and her life was saved. This is a great story. But a story in and of itself is not systems change. We need to take stories, science, political will, mix that with a framework that allows us to make systematic change. That's really the challenge. How do we take a solution and now bring it to those that need access to this solution worldwide? Here's another example I'll share with you. And if I suddenly took a step and ruptured my appendix, I hope you'd call 911 and whisk me off to a local hospital and I'd get my appendix taken out, or in fact, nowadays, probably a drain placed and placed on antibiotics, but I would survive. You know that five billion of our 7.3 to 7.5 billion population on Earth actually does not have access to emergency or essential surgery when necessary. So we looked at that. We looked at that with the same sort of critical eye, asking ourselves, what is it that is in the way of access to safe surgery and essential surgery when necessary? Well, what do you need? You need a surgeon. You need an operating theater. You need perioperative services. You need nurses. You don't need a lot of complex things, but you need a few basic things to provide an emergency operation. And you need anesthesia services. In fact, what's the most common operation that's necessary on Earth? It's the emergency cesarean section, actually. So we went through that lens and asked the question with the Boston Consulting Group and some other consultants worldwide, if there's one barrier, what's the greatest barrier? So we could create a solution for it. Turns out, lack of access to anesthesia. It's not somebody with a knife. That's more commonly available. So we did something remarkably disruptive, which is, is there a drug out there? Is there something we can use that's affordable, incredibly safe, and instead of training someone for years, we can train somebody in five days and safely operate on people when there's no anesthetist available? So we created a recipe using the drug ketamine. You can actually, for a dollar and 20 cents, there's enough drug in there for, uh, for five cesarean sections. What's happened to date across 17 facilities in India, we've been able to perform over 2,000 emergency operations that otherwise could not have been performed. Now the question is, how do you systematize that and go to scale? We're in the process of working with the College of Surgery from Southern, East, and Central Africa and hoping to be able to take this across 17 countries. But as you might imagine, politics play ambitions, money plays a role here. How do you create an economy around this? How do you not create a slippery slope so that this supplants? Every person on Earth certainly deserves quality anesthetists and quality anesthesia. How do you make sure that this doesn't cannibalize on what each of us deserve? Those are the challenges. Those are the areas that we need to innovate when we think about systems. I'll describe one more. Since I practice pediatrics as well as emergency medicine, I can't help but put beautiful children up every now and then. So the problem to solve, 6 million newborns and infants under age 5 die preventable deaths annually. And about 20 times this number don't die but become disabled. The most common cause is respiratory distress syndrome of the premature newborn. However, pneumonia and other infectious causes are right up there as well. So when we look at respiratory distress syndrome and pneumonia in in infants in particular worldwide, is there something out there that we could think about contributing and innovating around? Well, bubble CPAP. CPAP, for those that don't know what CPAP is, you may have someone in your family that snores or heard that they wear a device when they sleep that provides some pressure that they breathe against that allows their lungs to stay open. Well, the same or similar idea in infants, it really works. In newborns that are premature, there are CPAP devices that they can breathe against, and it decreases mortality by 65% and undoubtedly decreases brain damage, lung damage, and other damage to newborns even more than that. So when we look around the world, what about CPAP devices? Where are they? This is a picture in Kathmandu of a baby on CPAP. It's great. It's working. 
What's very important about CPAP is that it costs. Well, one of the great challenges, it costs a whole lot of money. This device is $4,500. The gold standard devices are between nine and $12,000. Absolutely unaffordable for the world at large. Why is it so expensive? It requires valves and motors to mix oxygen, to mix air in a precise way, because we know too much oxygen hurts babies considerably. It hurts their brains, hurts their lungs, and it makes them blind. Here is a clinic in India, ROP, retinopathy of prematurity. These are babies that were premature, that are now blind, and one of the causes, or one of the contributors, is too much oxygen. So blending air and oxygen is the expensive piece, and it's important, yet it's unaffordable to most of the world. So we asked ourselves, can we innovate around this? We went back to an old physics principle called the Bernoulli equation, and essentially just a simple piece of plastic, and then instead of having a motor and valves, a piece of plastic that has been nicely engineered, it's taken about four years to develop, and we have a device. This is our blender. Which now, which now, this blender takes the place of a motor, no longer requires electricity, and no longer requires, in many cases, compressed air. It just requires oxygen coming out in through this piece of plastic, through this piece of polymer. Here are pictures from our laboratory, and you can see this is the white version of the blender. But now, we have a CPAP device, the cost of materials are around $40 to $50, and flow, pressure, inspired concentrations of oxygen and humidity are all the same as a nine dollars to $12,000 device. Now there are opportunities. You can see this is now in Tanzania. This is in India. Now there are opportunities. Think about how can we go globally and go to scale? Here are recently some babies in Kenya. Here's a baby in India. And here, just this past week, at Muhimbili National Hospital in Tanzania, is a baby whose life's being saved on a device that has now become affordable. When even at the National Hospital, this particular technology was not affordable. So our challenge, our challenge is to think in new and different ways and look around ourselves and ask, how do we actually embrace and bring to us what's already known, what's in our surround, some of the greatest innovations I think that we are needing to embark on in the next decade are systems innovations. How do we take solutions and go sometimes against what's a human norm, which is how do we make more money even if incrementally we have very little change in outcome? We need to develop business models. We need to develop systems models to bring in new innovations. And those innovations are already in our space to help make our planet a healthier place. So thank you very much. Please welcome the chairman.